I want to speak to you guys. I'm equally yoked. Let me start by this man. His name is Muhammad Bal Abu Bakr. He's an Islamic cleric from Nigeria. What makes him very special and unique in his country is the fact that he has 86 wives. <laughs> that family portrait behind him is actually all of his wives. But obviously the conservative Muslims in the country didn't like this because according to Muslim law, you only allow four wives, not more. So he had 82 too many. So they actually forced him to divorce his wives. But she said, no, he's married to him, so I'm divorce him. So they said, okay, well, then you're going to have to face the death penalty. So then he decided divorce, death, divorce, death, all right, divorce. So you know what he done? On one day he had a mass divorce of 82 of his wives. He kept four of them. But I think we can do better than that. Here's a man, this man, his name is Fa, I guess you got the bottom of his heart to pronounce, Fati Ali Shan, Qajar. All right, he was the second king of Persia, Persian in modern day Iran. He had three very distinguishing characteristics about him. His long black beard. You all see that? Very, very stylish. The second thing, his very, very thin waist. For some reason, this guy's very, very thin waist. And the third thing was that he married 158 women. 158. I know you're looking forward to that, right? 158 women. Most of them were princesses. Obviously, to that he had 270 children and some 782 grandchildren. Imagine having a family that big, hey, wow. <laughs> but as I said, let's do one better. There is somebody else in history that had more wives than that. King Solomon in the Bible. Anybody know how many wives he had? He had 700 wives. I know you, you smile because you like that idea. <laughs> king Solomon in the Bible was the king of Israel. The Bible declares that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Concubines is like secondary wives. The 700 were royal birth and the rest were like B grade. Now you get A grade wives and B grade wives. So he actually had a thousand women telling him every day what to do. That's Can you believe that? That's why he's so wise. That's why he's so wise. But now because I know you don't believe me, I'm going to read that. So let's open. I know we have a bit one. <laughs> I'm not pronouncing my name, 700 words. <laughs> Let's read that story together in 1 Kings chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, please open to 1 Kings, it's in the Old Testament, to read the story of Solomon and his 700 wives, and how they did not lead him to wisdom, but led him astray. Just to comment on what just was said earlier. <laughs> 1 Kings chapter 11, read the first four verses. Just wait for the people get there, Tony. Ken Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides, besides Pharaoh's daughter. My other wives, Ammonites, Edomites, Sindonites, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, You must not intermarry with them, because they will suddenly turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart of the other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. The name Solomon means peaceful. He got that before he got married to 700 women, obviously. His name was peaceful before he got married. And after he got married to 700 women, they called him Penny McKenny. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon is the second son of King David. King David was the second king of Israel. Who can tell me he was the first king of Israel? Saul. Yes. Saul, well done. So that's important because there was only three kings of united Israel. The first king of Israel, united Israel, was Saul. After him, David took over the throne after he died. And then after David died, he gave the throne to his son Solomon. And that's important because they were the only three kings of united Israel. After that, Israel was divided into two kingdoms and then so was demise. The other interesting thing about those three kings is that each of them reigned for exactly 40 years. Isn't that interesting? They each reigned for 40 years and then the kingdom was divided. So here we have Solomon, the second son of David. David, we know, was a man of the God's own heart. He was a man who loved God. He praised God. Man, he couldn't have had a better father than David. So he was brought into a very good royal family. He started the throne at a very young age, though, at the age of about 16. So Solomon took over this great empire of David at the young age of 16. 
Eventually, when he settled in, the first thing he'd done was he got married, as all young good men do. And he got married to the Egyptian pharaoh's daughter. And this wasn't always motivated by love, as we'll find out in the message going forward. It was politically motivated, because what happened in those days, the, the countries nearby, you wouldn't want to fight with you because you were so great, so they made an alliance with your peace treaty. So the, the pharaoh of Egypt said, listen, I don't, let's make an alliance, and you steal the deal, the, the deal. yep, here's my daughter. So that's what happened. So he married the first foreign wife, which was the Egyptian pharaoh's daughter. And God asked Solomon, what can I give you? Now that you're the king of Israel, what do you want from me? And who knows what he asked for? Wisdom. That's what he asked for, was wisdom. He said, God just grant me an understanding of the of wisdom. And he done that, and he became the wisest man in all the world. People from all over the world traveled to see Solomon and to hear his wise words. It says that he wrote a thousand proverbs, a thousand and five songs. Did you know that he was a songwriter? He wrote more songs and songs than his father David. It says that he knew everything about anything. All about plants and animals, people all over the world wondered at the wise words of this great man, Solomon. And not only that, he was very wealthy and in a great empire. So let me show you how big his empire was. All the blue, not the blue, the yellow part is the empire of Solomon. It ranges from the Sinai Peninsula right up, crosses the Jordan, right up into modern day Syria. Compared to that little red spot in the middle, that is current day Israel. See uh, what the kingdom was and where it is today. Today, obviously, Syria has taken over the top part, Jordan has taken over this part, and Egypt obviously contains that part. But that's how great his empire was. He was the wealthiest man in all the world, he was the wisest man in all the world, and he had all the women in the world too. But we'll get to that shortly. Not only that, one of his first tasks as king was to build the temple of God. A while ago, we had uh, Pastor Kenny talking about. King David wanted to build the temple. Remember, he wanted to build the house of God. God said, no, no, you're not going to build it because your hands are full of blood. He's a warrior, a wartime person. So he said, no, I'm going to leave the temple for your son. And Solomon actually had the great privilege of building this great, big, biggest and baddest temple of the day. It was 90 feet uh, long, 45 feet high, and 30 feet wide. And as you can see, it was just amazing you had to get all the resources of gold and timber from other countries because Israel didn't actually have them. They didn't have their own resources of timber and gold, so they had to actually outsource this. When Solomon came to dedicate the temple, he stood before the temple, before all of Israel, and he prayed a long 31 verse prayer. If you pray 31 verses, you're really, really close to God. You know what I mean? So he prayed this prayer and he prayed for everyone, for everything, for every situation. So, so far in the life of Solomon, things were good. He was wise, he had wealth, he had this great empire of peace. At the, when he took over the throne, there was no war with anyone. Because David had conquered all his enemies. So he came to this peaceful reign, wisest man, he built the temple. So, so far, things were getting good. But that's not how his life ends. If you read the rest of the story of Solomon, he actually ends in obscurity. Like a decrepit old man, lamenting over what he's lost in life. His great empire is torn in two given to his son and his general. And from then, generations later, the Israelites themselves get taken into exile by the Syrians and Babylonians. If you've ever read the book Ecclesiastes, if you ever, who's familiar with the book Ecclesiastes, if you've ever read it, do yourself a favor. This is a book written by Solomon. So after all I've told you about the greatness of this man, and you read that book, it doesn't sound like this great man we're speaking about. Because in this whole book, he laments over what's the meaning of life. It's in Ecclesiastes where he says, there's a time to die. A time to be born, a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to dance and all that. And in this book he says, you know, I've amassed all the, the wealth in the world, I've got all the women in the world, and yet I'm still unhappy. There's still a void in my life. And what was it? It was God. Because of those foreign wives, his heart was turned from God. And he ends up in obscurity, not as great as David his father was. He ends up like a footnote in history. Why? Because his heart was turned from God. And then you might think it all started with one thing, with him marrying those 700 women. That's where it all started. And as I said, the first time, right when Tony read for us, the first part says, Solomon loved foreign women. Now there's nothing wrong with loving foreign women, guys. Right? I love foreign women. I think Israeli women are the most beautiful women on this planet. Then again, I also like the chicks from Sweden. Their blonde hair and blue eyes, they are smoking hot. I love Irish women. Man, there's something about their accent. I 
Tell my wife, you're going to go to Ireland, I'm never coming back. There's something about that Irish accent that just blows me, man. That like, blows my head back. And then Brazilian woman, oh, Brazilian woman. <laughs> dark hair, yeah, dark tan, with big brown eyes. I love foreign women. So I agree with Solomon. There's nothing wrong with loving foreign women. When you marry 700 of them, that becomes a problem. Right? That's what his problem was. It wasn't that he liked this woman. He actually went out and he married 700 of them. And that caused his downfall. The other problem with marrying his woman, as I said before, was not only love, but it was politically motivated. So remember he had this big empire I showed you. And he had all these little kings all around Israel. And they didn't want to fight with him because, man, this is like the greatest king in the world. So do not fight him because of war with him. They called the new peace treaties with him. So all the kings around Israel, as far as the eye could see, came to him and said, listen, let's make a deal, let's make a peace. Let us be in alliance with each other. And by the way, yeah, you can have my daughter. Take my wife also as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother-in-law, take her also. Take mother-in-law, but that's what he done. So all, so all he done was when he went through his life, some obviously was motivated by love, like he wrote the book Song of Solomon, and there you can see this love for this woman that he married. But most of the time it was politically motivated. So he just went into a country and said, All right, we will be a peace treaty, give me your wife, give me your daughter. And he went home, and that was it. So after a while he amassed how many? 700 women. And then you might think, Well, why did God allow that? Is that a good question? Why did God allow him in the first place to have 700 wives? Well, you see, God's allowance of something is not the same as God's approval of something. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world today that God allows, but He doesn't approve of. And you know why? Because this beautiful little thing God gave us is called free will. Everybody say that. Free will. We are not puppets. We are not robots. God gives us His instructions. He gives us the law. He gives us the commandments. And says, if you follow these things, things should be good for you. And if you disobey these things, it's probably not going to turn out that way. That was it. And he gave those same laws and commandments to Solomon. And Solomon wasn't a puppet king. He wasn't forced to do what was right. He said, Solomon, here's my laws and commandments. Follow these things and things are going to be good for you and your kingdom. And if you disobey these things, well then suffer the consequences. And he gave him laws. In Deuteronomy, these were the laws of the kings. The first one is do not multiply horses. God didn't want the kings to rely on their military power. So he said, do not amass too many horses. If you read the Chronicles of Solomon, we find out that he had 40,000 stalls for horses and chariots. So he failed that one miserably. The next one, do not multiply wives. We've just read that he had 700 wives, foreign wives. God made it very specific, do not intermarry. He said it, don't intermarry, don't marry these foreign women because they can cause you to go astray. He failed that one miserably too. And then, do not multiply silver and gold. He was the richest man in the world. He was, if I'm not mistaken, the fifth richest man in history that ever lived on this planet. That's how rich he was. To give an idea of how rich he was, when he was building the temple, just to build the upper room of the temple, they used 20 tons of gold. Now, you think 20 tons, that's a lot, it's a big number. You know those Hestiny trucks that ride around? Hestiny, it's a white truck with Hestiny on it. That is about 20 tons. So when you ride past that thing again, think of that thing filled with gold. Then you phone me. Right? <laughs> I'm just check, but it's full of gold. That's how much gold he used, just in this one room. And that was in the temple. That's what had all the other gold he used in the temple. Incidentally, it also took him 13 years to build his palace. It took him 7 years to build the temple. And he used so much gold. It took him 13 years to build his own palace. Imagine how many gold was in there. So he was the richest man in the world, and there he failed miserably too. The bottom says, someone broke all of these instructions. We read there, 1 Kings 10 to 11, all of these three things he broke. So God gave him the law and said, listen, this is it, Solomon, do this, and things are going to be all right with you. But he didn't. He disobeyed those laws, and he had to suffer the consequences. He also man that started good. Remember, he started great. Many of us start good as Christians. We get a good foundation, we go to youth and, and become Christian, we get very excited and then through our life what happens? We get married and then it all starts. No, it doesn't always start like that. <laughs> Some of you are, yeah, hey, no, it's not always like that. But women don't always cause a downfall, guys. Sometimes, yeah, or up another whole place. What happens was, through life, we, we, the world kind of gets to us and we get all these other things on our plate and all of a sudden God becomes a distant, distant memory. And our 20 years later, I'm not going to go to church because there might be something wrong in my life. That's what happened to Solomon. He starts off good, but God isn't concerned about how you start. He's very, very much concerned about how you end your life. 
It's not so much how you start the Christian walk, but how do you end it? Are we going to end up like Solomon, a crippled old man with your heart turned far from God? Or are we going to end on the high road, saying, God, I fought the good fight. I finished my race, I've kept the faith. That's what we need to do. Here's a man that started by building the temple of God, and he ended up by building altars to foreign gods. Worshipping those gods, sacrificing to those gods. He has a man who started in peace. And he ended his life in war with his enemies. He has a man who started with a big unified kingdom on the biggest empires in the world. He ended with that empire being torn in two. Eventually the Syrians came and conquered the northern kingdom. The Babylonians came and conquered the southern kingdom. And the Israelites, they were taken away as slaves into foreign lands. All because of one man's action. One man chose to disobey God, and not only did he suffer those consequences, but generations after him suffered through his one mistake, through his bad decisions. And you know, it all boils down to one simple principle. The principle found in the New Testament. It's called Anikudiyo. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 it says this. Do not be unequally yoked. Everybody say that. Unequally yoked. Together with unbelievers. The key there is unequally yoked with unbelievers. All right. For what fellowship is righteous with the lawlessness and what communion is like with darkness and what accord is Christ with Belial or the devil or what has a believer with an unbeliever. We're only going to be focused on those two words. What are those two words? Unequally yoked. So before we even get into that, that, a lot of words were said, but we just want to understand what does that mean, unequally yoked. First, we've got to understand is what is a yoke? Anybody know what a yoke is? You can tell me what is a yoke. Sorry? In the egg. I, I thought some blonde would say that. No, it's not that yoke in the egg. A yoke is actually this. It's a wooden bar, a single one wooden bar that holds two animals together. So it's one single yoke, and what it is, is you can see these things actually go around the neck of the animal. Alright? And the yoke is used. So for farmers, this is agricultural time, farmers would have two oxen or two cattle that would yoke them together of the same size and strength, and then they would be used to plough the ground or to carry a cart like in this case. So that's what a yoke was used for. Science and physics tells us that all things being equal, if you had the oxen the same weight, same size, same strength, and they work together on a yoke, the productivity and outcome would not only be double, but triple and quadruple, because they are working together. As opposed to working separately, they only do 100%, they will just do their job. But being equally yoked like that means that productivity and outcome will be positive and will be double, triple, and quadruple. Right? So that's what it means to be equally yoked. Right? And this is used all the time, still today, in third world countries. Now, let's try to apply that to our lives. How is it that you can be equally yoked with a believer? Let me explain that to you. It will be in an environment where you are with someone for a long period of time in a close, intimate relationship. So that might be your partner, your, your partner, husband or wife, and it also might be in your work relationship. So you, in a, let's for example, I'm going to give you an illustration in an office. So me and you, I'm in an office, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we work together. For 19 hours a day, you see me. That'll be, well, yeah, I know you guys are looking forward to that. The way you are for me, that'll be great, me and you. But about we Christians? So we've got the same mind, the same vision, we love Jesus and we worship Him. And, and when we talk to each other, we encourage each other with scriptures. And that's kind of good, don't you think? You know, now you're getting to talk about the Bible. Now you're getting to just encourage each other. And at the end of the day, we should be kind of happy. We should be fulfilled. That's a good thing. The outcome will be positive. Why? Because we're Christians with the same mindset. You understand? So say positive. Everyone say positive. positive. So if I'm equally young with a believer, the outcome will be positive. Yes. But that's not what Paul says, is it? He says unequally young with an unbeliever. What is unequally young? That is unequally. So now, if a farmer has only got one ox, he has to use a donkey. And he puts a donkey next to that thing. Now, this scenario becomes unequally yoked. Two reasons. Mainly, these animals are different animals. All right? The oxen or the cattle, it's actually one that uh, uh, obeys his functions well. The farmer says, go, go, and eat it. It will do the job. Ah, but the donkey, he's as stubborn as a mule. All right? Because he doesn't do the job. He hates instructions. The other thing that's very bad about uh, yoking these two bad animals together is the fact that this one is small and thin, this one is big and strong. So now let's apply that, let's use that in a farming environment. 
So these two animals again, and this oxen just moving, moving as long as <laughs> That's not going to be good. So physics tells us now that uh, as opposite an equally yoke, double, triple, quadruple, now what happens is immediately before they even start, it decreases by 50 percent because of the donkey. The donkey is not like the oxen. And now you can imagine as they start walking, eventually the oxen got to stop and then wait for the donkey. <coughs> donkey drops up and then they go forward. So you can imagine that yoke now it's going jack, 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 stop me, jack, 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 and then the donkey stops for half an hour. Do you think the outcome will be positive or negative? Negative. Everybody say negative again. Negative. negative. You see the difference? Equally open a believer, positive outcome, a good outcome, you leave the day happy. I'm equally open, I'm a believer. It's going to be problems. It's a very bad relationship. And the farmers got to get rid of those two animals. Go separate them and, and put more animals that are alike together if you want to see productivity get better. The other thing is having them unequally open, like that is dangerous. It's dangerous for both animals. Not only for the donkey. It's for the other animal as well, because as that thing hits, they, they, they've been hurt. Both animals are going to be damaged at the end of the day if they are unequally ill. So now let's go back to our office environment. All right? Now you're in the office and I get transferred. Yay, I'm overseas. I go to Hawaii. And now somebody else comes into the office. And this is not a believer. He's a non-believer. But man, if you ever want an unequally yoked non-believer, this guy comes in. And immediately he finds that you're a Christian. He says, oh, I'm an atheist. <laughs> you're a Christian, you wouldn't even have a funny Jesus guy. You know, how's that going to feel? He sits down. The first words out of his mouth is cursing and swearing. The worst, filthiest, Dave club swearing you've ever heard in your life. Comes out of his mouth. What do you think, Des? Would you like that? And not only does he swear filthy, but he blasphemes. I know Lord isn't like that Forget about New Zealand. This guy, every second sentence is there, there, blaspheme, blaspheme, blaspheme. He's got tattoos of all vulgar images down his arms. And not only that, he smokes. Not in designated areas. No job. He smokes in the office. And he smokes Marlboro's. You know what Marlboro is? It's a very strong cigarette. So you only have to start person swimming, mocking you because of your faith. He's sitting down smoking a cigarette and... Now you are unequally here with an unbeliever. You've got to spend 9 to 10 hours with that guy. Do you think the outcome will be positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Because either you will die or you will kill me. End of the story. Right? <laughs> and I've been in those relationships before in my work relationships where I've had people that I've worked with for long, long periods of time and they were like that. They were swearing, blasphemous, that they were atheists. They listen to the most horrible music. And you know, you've got to grin and bear it sometimes. But I was praying, man. I was praying, God, you need to get me out of here or I'm going to kill this guy. You have a choice now. And luckily, through those prayers, God has to move me to different departments. Where now I'm finally in my own office, so I don't have any of that, that environment. But that is the story of being unequally yoked with unbeliever. Go back to Solomon. It all started with him being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because he had his foreign wives and they worshipped their own gods and wanted their own altars. He had a choice. He could have said, no, wait a minute. I'm not going to be unequally open with you guys. I'm going to be separate. I'm going to worship Jehovah, Yahweh, my God. You guys do whatever else you want. But he didn't. He spent lots of time with his wives. So much further that he built altars to their gods. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to go to the temple today. I'm going to sacrifice and worship this your God. And that's where his demise came. Why? Because he was unequally yoked with unbelievers. At the end of this verse, Paul actually says, he says, the bottom line is this, guys, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's it. That, that was his sins. Christians, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. Come out from among them and be ye separate. And remember, this isn't about salvation and about witness. And some of you are thinking, well, does that mean I mustn't talk to a non-believer? So where does that mean? Must I only hang out with Christians? No. The gauge is simple. The person that you're with in the office, even if he's a non-believer, will the outcome be positive or negative on your spiritual and personal emotional life? If you look at this person and say it's going to be negative, then you've got to get the hell out of that relationship. And it might even be your partner. I've spoken to many, many people, unfortunately, that are married into non-believing relationships. And it always, unfortunately, is very, very bad. Because the non-Christian just doesn't understand. And eventually it gets violent, abusive, and you force praise. Do not be unequally yoked. Solomon fell through that one simple principle. I need you to come out from among them and be ye separate. Paul wrote to Corinthians. 
And uh, in the Bible study, we study, remember the church of Corinth. It was a small, the first church that Paul started in Greece. Corinthian church. And it was a good church. But the problem was that the place of Corinth was very, very bad. Sexual immoral. It was, it was like Las Vegas. It was like the worst place on earth you could probably want to be. And he writes this to them and he says to them, oh, I see that, I don't see that. Very important for me. He writes to them and he says, listen guys, don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. I know it's tough because you're surrounded by all these guys who worship foreign gods and temples. But don't go to their temples. Don't eat their food. Don't sit for nine, ten hours a day with these people and listen to their rubbish. He says to them, come out from among them. Be a good Christian church and don't get involved in their stuff. And you know the same applies for you and I today. If we're in relation to whether it be our family, our brothers and sisters, whether it be our own, or whether it even be a work situation, you got to come out from among them. Even if you have to go to your boss and say, you've got to get me out of this. I can't be in this office with this person. That's what you've got to do. And you know, it's not only kings that happen to see celebrities all the time. Who knows this man? Brad Pitt. Wow. Jocko. <laughs> I know he's good looking, Jock, but... <laughs> Jock's probably got a photo of me on his profile. Brad Pitt, famous actor, Hollywood actor. He was raised in a Baptist church. He had to sing in the choir. Can you a very good upbringing, wasn't it? A good Christian household. Mom and dad were Christians. Sang in the choir. He knew all about Jesus, all about God, all about salvation. Today, he's an atheist. He's very outspoken, but he's atheism. He says he's 20% atheist and 80% agnostic. Agnostic means that you believe in a higher power. Do not believe in the God of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Red Pitt. Anybody know him? George Clooney. The outspoken atheist. Brought up a Catholic. Catholics and Protestants are the same. They believe in Jesus Christ. He knows the doctrine of salvation. He knows about God and the Bible. Today, the outspoken atheist. Kevin Bacon. Of the Footloose days. Hey, days, remember Footloose? <laughs> Way back, about 45 million years ago. Also, raising Catholic. Knows about Jesus. Knows about the Bible today. An outspoken atheist. Who's that, Tony? Daniel Radcliffe. Harry Potter. From Harry Potter. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Christian. To me, that's going to be like the best life ever. <laughs> Your mother was a Jew and your father was a Christian. Although the, the religions aren't the same men, they're like in the Old Testament and New Testament. So he had the, the perfect life. He knew about the Old Testament and he knew about the New Testament. He knew about Jesus. He knew about salvation. He was brought up in that household. Some way during maybe the Harry Potter series. I don't know. Maybe all the fame and fortune of Hollywood. Maybe he got mixed up in the wrong crowd of friends. I don't know. But today he's a militant atheist. And now, you know, atheist is bad enough, but he, comes, he, uh, he says to himself, he's a militant. That just sounds bad by that. He's a militant atheist. He doesn't believe in the God of the Old Testament. He doesn't believe in the God of the New Testament. He doesn't believe in anything. What happened to these guys? Was it the fame and fortune of Hollywood? They were good upbringings just like Solomon. They had everything gained for them all of a sudden. Maybe the wrong crowd of friends. Maybe they had friends that influenced them to become unbelievers or atheists. And all of a sudden, they were unequally yoked with unbelievers. And before they know what happened, they were atheists. Now they wake up 20, 40 years later, and they're atheists. Why? Because they were unequally yoked with unbelievers. You see how important that principle is? Man, you can't miss that one. If it happened to Solomon, the greatest king in the world, if it happened to these people, it can happen to us, and it does happen to us. We must be vigilant and not let it happen to us. Does it happen to all the Hollywood actors? No, not all of them. Give me a surname of these guys. Baldwin. Baldwin. <laughs> these are the Baldwin brothers. I don't know if you even know that they're all brothers, but we're all familiar with Alec Baldwin. He's like a famous one. On the left hand side is Billy Baldwin, Stephen Baldwin, Alec and Daniel Baldwin. They're all Hollywood actors. They're all known for their very wild lifestyle of sex, drugs and rock and roll. They've all had how many wives and divorces. They're all addicted to drugs and alcohol. So do the same. But one of them stands out from amongst the rest. And is this guy here? Stephen Baldwin. Let me tell you his story. He had the same life as his brothers. He was unequally yoked with unbelievers. He smoked and drank and he done drugs. He was very abusive. Well, let me say he was a very drug and alcohol abuser. 
And he carried on his life as the rest of his brothers would. And he married a Brazilian lady, a foreign lady, nonetheless, a Brazilian lady called Kenya. And then they had two children. And then he hired a, a nanny from Brazil. Her name is Augusta. Another Brazilian lady. She couldn't speak English. And she was a Christian. She couldn't speak a word of English, but she could sing in English. Man, so she would go around the house all day singing gospel songs. Singing songs about Jesus. And eventually in time, Kenya, Stephen's wife, said to her, listen, tell me more about this Jesus that you're singing about all the time. And she laughed and said, you know, you won't believe this. You're speaking Portuguese. They're both Brazilian. Speaking Portuguese to each other. Augusta said to Kenya, you know, you won't believe this. But before I came here, God sent me to you. And he said that you will both become saved, both become Christians. And both started ministry for you. Well, she was shocked. She went to her husband and Stephen. And said, hey, this is what this chick says. We're going to become Christians. He said, oh, that will never happen. There's no Jesus in my house, right? I'm start with that Jesus freak stuff. It's not happening. And he continued his life. Eventually in time, Kenya was saved. She became a Christian. So Kenya and Augusta prayed for Stephen's salvation. They prayed for him. He wasn't interested. But then one singular event happened in American history that changed everything. Actually, it changed things for the whole world. But very important for this one man, it was 9-11. The terrorist attack in America. At that time, when the, the airplanes were hitting, thousands of people flocked to the churches because they thought this was the end of the world. They thought Jesus is coming back. And with him, he heard about this and he heard, listen, well, you know, all is going on. Jesus couldn't come back tomorrow. <coughs> and my heart's not right with him. And you know what happened? Stephen, of all his drug abuse and alcohol abuse, all that he's been through, he went to his backyard, he raised his hands and he said, God, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to commit my life to you. He said this, these exact words, I dedicate my life to you 1,000%. He wasn't much of a mathematician. But he said, I dedicate my life to you 1,000%. That's how much he wanted to become a Christian. And he did. He converted his life to Christ. He stopped all his drug and alcohol abuse. Today, him and Kenya have a ministry that touches thousands across America. Why? Because he chose not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. His brothers could have carried on. He wasn't interested in them. He wasn't going to live that life. So he separated himself from them. He separated himself from all his friends that had the nightclubs and the drugs and the drink and, and all the women. He said, no, that's not my lifestyle. Why? Because I want to be separate and I want to come out from among them. It doesn't mean that if you ask around by these people, you're going to stay there and die there. Like these other guys and like Solomon. You can make a difference in your life. That difference will start with you. With that one single principle. What's those two words in the principle? Unequally yoked. Say it again. <coughs> Unequally yoked. If you are unequally yoked with unbelievers, the outcome will be negative. My encouragement you is to be equally yoked with believers. And the outcome will be <coughs> I need you to walk out of this church today with a new understanding of what that means, unequally yoked. I need you to walk out with the same sentiment as Stephen has. You can either walk out here like, oh wait, one more, but Stephen. Ah, man. As I said, this guy wasn't like the, the, the genius of the bunch, but this is what he says. You know, there's so many quotes of theologians and they're all so beautiful, but this one got me on my face. He says, if loving Jesus is what's important to me. And that bit sounds okay, but that's the truth. And I just love that. He's so simple, so humble. All he does, he says he loves Jesus. And you know, if you don't like it, I'll do it with you. you know? That's my belief. And that's why I like this guy so much. He's so humble and honest. And he, he, he might not be the cleverest guy out there, but he loves Jesus. And you know what? He loves him a thousand percent. When you leave this church, I need you to walk out there on your green grass, raise your hands and say, God, I dedicate my life to you a thousand percent. And that might be changing things in my life. Changing relationships might be changing work environments. But God, I want that in my life. I don't want to end up like Solomon. I want to end up like Stephen. So do that. Leave this church. You can make a difference for God. Make sure that you grow in the kingdom of God. For the glory of God. And it's all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to